Hey, let me catch you up. So the book of Jonah opens up, and Jonah receives the word of the Lord, and he, he takes it, and God says, I want you to go to Nineveh, that great city. I want you to call out against it. Jonah hears the word of the Lord, and he heads in the opposite direction. Heading in the opposite direction, he hires a ship. He goes down into it. He's taking a cat nap. The storm hits the waters. The sailors call him up on board. Everybody call out to your own God. So there's just this... All these people calling out to their own gods. Jonah's standing by. They're not really sure what to do. They cast lots trying to figure out on whose account this horrible thing has happened. The lot falls to Jonah. And they say, tell us about you. And he says, I am a Hebrew. I worship the Lord God who made the sea and the dry land. It is on account of me that these things have happened to you. So they're like, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? So they row with all their might and they go exactly nowhere. They find themselves in exactly the same predicament. So they turn to Jonah, okay, Hebrew, okay, one who worships and fears the Lord God who made the sea and the dry land. Tell us what we need to do. And so he says, pitch me overboard. Make me go splishy, splashy, and this will all uh, be fine. This will all clear itself up. They don't want to do that. We've already said they rode. They go nowhere. Eventually, they're faced with the predicament that what they have to do is to throw Jonah overboard. And at the moment they throw him overboard and everything becomes perfectly calm, our passage picks up. Now, even as we do this and you're to walk up and you're to ask 10 out of 10 people likely in the church and say, hey, tell me a little bit about the, the book of Jonah. We hear something about an obstinate prophet and then a great deal about a fish. We hear something about a prophet who heard the word of the Lord and then a great deal on and on about this fish and, and kind of met into their storytelling would probably be this image from the Disney cartoon Pinocchio where you've got this, uh, I'm a real boy, inside, uh, inside the fish. And he's kind of going back and forth with the desk and, and, and all this. And so it really has nothing to do with the book of Jonah. In fact, what I want you to recognize is that the fish is only mentioned twice in the entirety of this book. It's mentioned uh, once in verse 17 and once in chapter 2 and verse 10. And so it's not a book about a fish, but it's something about the God who created that fish and what he delights to do in Jonah and what he delights in doing in my life and in your life and the life of all those who named the name Jesus. Amen? Amen? Now look at what God did with this fish. Lest we pass over this, I want you to see this. And the Lord, everybody say appointed the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. So over the course of Jonah's life, God has been raising and caring, intending to this fish whose sole purpose for existence was the display of God's creativity and delight and to swallow Jonah whole. Like this is it for the fish. Now, somewhere along there, he's also made his way into probably no small number of Mediterranean uh, fish stories. I caught a fish one time. He was this big if he's an inch. Y'all, he was this big. Like, you're just kind of holding the camera right there. And so God appointed, God sovereignly, the God of the universe, the God who created the sea and the dry land, created this fish for the express purpose purpose of intersecting Jonah at the point of his sinfulness. And so Jonah is going to be kept and captivated within this fish for three days. Now, when we think about the things that Jonah's experienced, Jonah's dead asleep in the bottom of this boat. Everybody's yelling at him. He stumbles to the top. He doesn't realize there's a storm. And from the the ferocity of this storm, he's thrown into the water. And when he's thrown into the water, what he recognizes that as he's sinking, the world around him begins to get very quiet and very calm all of a sudden. And while he finds himself in this fish, he recognizes that he's in a situation that he can't control, and that he's in a situation as a result of his behavior, of his choices. And so God uses this fish to bring about the affliction that is a visitation of God's sweet mercy brought close to Jonah. It says, then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the belly of the fish, saying, Do you remember when Jonah's brought up onto the deck and everybody's there and everybody's calling out to their own God and everybody has their own particular way of doing that and and they turn to Jonah and they say, call on your God, perhaps he'll intercede and, and we'll all be saved. One of the things the text doesn't say in that is that, and Jonah called out to his God. So this is actually the first recording that we have evidence that Jonah actually turns his heart towards God. We see that God is using this fish to dial in Jonah's heart to hear from God and to speak to God. 
And so what we see within, uh, really, verse 2 through verse 9 is the articulation of the prayer that Jonah begins to say before the Lord. So <clears throat> he's in there, he prays out, in verse 2 he says, I called out to the Lord out of my, everybody say distress. Out of my distress, bless you. And he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. So we're in the middle of this, Jonah begins to cry out to the Lord. He recognizes there's nothing can, he can do. There's, there's no amount of kicking against the fish. There's no long, a matter of kind of reaching up and tickling its insides to have him spit up on a dry land. He is stuck, and as he's in there, what he recognizes is that God is doing a work in him. So he cries out to God. And we hear this amazing thing. As he cries out, we've not seen in Jonah any type of penitence. We've not seen in Jonah any type of brokenness. So the amazing thing we come to learn, not about Jonah and his transformation, the amazing thing we come to learn about God is at the point of his distress and he cries out, God hears him. And the hearing of Jonah isn't something that he hopes, but it's something in that moment he knows. I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know what distress looks like for you. For a lot of us, it's, it's not the acute sense of distress. It's the acute sense that we're trying to not be distressed. So how are you doing this morning? You'd say, oh, I'm, I'm fine, I'm okay. Because we really don't want to have any curiosity. We don't want to delve into the fact that we're not okay. We don't want to delve into the fact that we are experiencing some form of distress. Because to not be okay, it's going to be an issue for us. You're a student, you're not okay because your parents are fighting. You're, you're a parent, you're not okay because your kids are wayward. You're married, you're not okay because you and your spouse aren't talking. You're not connecting. You're at work, you're not okay because your boss is a jerk and you just don't know how things are going to go and, and he just fires people for jollies. But it's terrifying to, to say in the middle of this, I'm not actually okay. I'm experiencing distress. I'm experiencing terror. I'm experiencing anxiety of this. And so what John, in the middle of this, what he recognizes is that when he calls out in distress, the same promise that you and I can know, he answers us. You see, God longs to respond to his people, especially his people at the point of distress. And sometimes God allows us to experience distress so that we would call on him instead of being independent. Instead of living our lives as if we were autonomous, living our lives as if we didn't need him, sometimes he allows difficulties to be introduced into our lives to drive us to the point of need. So Jonah here is at this point of need. He cries out in distress, and he knows that God hears his voice. You see, more than just knowing that God hears his voice, Jonah comes into this to this knowledge that I think is difficult, difficult for a great number of us is that God is the author, in some sense, of his distress. Do you see what he says? You cast me, verse 3, into the deep. You know, it would have been something, right, for Jonah that he's there and he's, he's, he's going down and down in the water. He makes his way into the belly of the fish and, and all of a sudden he's thinking, I gave horrible advice to those Phoenician mariners. When they asked me what they needed to do, I should have said, you get back there and roll harder. <laughs> Instead, I said, hey, grab me. And I was joking. Clearly, they knew it was a joke. I was smiling as I said it. I said, grab me and throw me overboard. And they thought it was the most delightful news they'd ever heard. They grabbed me and they threw me overboard. No, Jonah sees them. He sees their actions. Ultimately, as an action from the Lord, he says, you cast me here. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. Look at what he writes next. Your waves and your billows, they passed over me. What's Jonah describing? Jonah's describing what it is to drown. Jonah's describing what it is to feel yourself run out of energy and effort to have the ability to stay above water to keep your head above the water where you can draw breath into your lungs. He's describing what it is to feel yourself succumb to the pressure of the waves, to succumb to the pressure of the billowing waters mounding over the top of him, closing over him. 
But you notice when he describes them, he doesn't refer to them as the waves and the billows. He says, God, these are yours. They're the instruments God was using to tune the heart of Jonah to hear the voice of God. God was using all of nature to reach the heart of his prophet. So Jonah saw God in all that was happening to him. And he saw the hand of God in all that he was experiencing. And in verses 4 through 6, we see Jonah describe the reality of his experience, but we also see how he has a heart that wants to lean towards hope. Look at what he writes. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall look again upon your holy temple. Even as Jonah felt himself sink down and down, he saw uh, the light turn to dark. He felt himself go further and further into the waters. He had this sense of hope, not based on his ability to once again resurface, but based upon who he knew God to be. He says, as I felt myself go down, I was driven from your side. I knew that I would look on your holy temple again. The water closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. The weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought me up my life from the pit, O oh Lord my God. So I think the picture in a lot of our minds is that Jonah goes overboard and somewhere as he's doing like this flying squirrel, maimed slightly, headed towards the water, throwing his arms around, flailing his legs, this fish comes up and goes, Hoop, and just grabs him. But that's not a picture of the way Jonah describes it. Notice that when he's in this poetic response and he's reflecting on the things he's experienced, the fish plays no role in it. So what Jonah actually experiences is going overboard and then sinking lower and lower and lower to the seaweed begins to wrap around him. He begins to feel the pressure of the water on his ears. He begins to feel the pressure on his body. He begins to feel the air in his lungs expire, his lungs burning to breathe, to draw in air again. He begins to feel himself beginning to pass from consciousness to being unconscious. He thought he was dead. He thought his life was no more. He thought this was the end, and this is the result of my actions. This is the result of my choices. Verse 7. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you in your holy temple. You see, it was this, this moment of key critical importance. Hanging kind of in this balance of, of life and death, realizing the consequences of his actions and his choices. Jonah didn't say, I redoubled my efforts. I began to kick with all my might. I began to swim with the, toward the sky. He says, I remembered the Lord. It was his experience of drowning. It was his captivity within the belly of the fish which taught Jonah something that he could not learn outside of it. There's a pastor named R.T. Kendall who pastored a church in London, England, referred to as, as Westminster Chapel. He's actually a, a Kentucky native that moved over there for a time. And he's got a little book, uh, it's called An Exposition of Jonah. Man, if you're looking to go deeper in the book of Jonah, I heartily recommend it to you. It has just absolutely destroyed my life this week because I've read through this and, and given myself in some sense to a vision of what it's like to experience the affliction of God, to experience the consequences for our actions, to, and to experience those things that God brings into our life. And so Kendall describing this and describing the fish, he said, the belly of the fish is not a happy place to live, but it is a good place to learn. The belly of the fish is not a happy place to live. There's no amount of comfort. There's no amount of joy in there for Jonah. There's no solace in there. But it is a good place to learn. So he goes on to talk about oppression and affliction. And so I want us to focus just for a moment on the idea of affliction. Affliction, 
as God uses it, is allowing us to suffer consequences for our behavior or allowing us to experience something painful for a future outcome. So I want us to think about it in terms of, of really three categories, okay? One of these is to understand that affliction is going to feel like it is too long. It's going to feel like it is too long. It's not one of these awkward conversations where when you get into it, you break out in a sweat everywhere and you think, somebody has got to rescue me because this person has two things going for them, a lack of social awareness and they're a close talker. They don't realize I don't want to talk about these things and they don't realize that I want to, that I don't want to feel their breath on me while they're talking. Mm. I think they had onion at some point last week and they've not handled up on that. It feels too long. It feels too long. When Jonah's in there, he's, he's lost all of time. He has no idea how long he's in there. He doesn't have the, the sun to regulate his, his body to know how long he's been in there. It's not like he, he pulls up his watch. He's like, ah, the battery's died. He has no ability to know how long he's been in there. But for every moment he's in there, it feels too long. For every moment that he goes without drawing in fresh air, for every moment that he goes without seeing the sky, for every moment that he is confined for every moment that he is compressed, for every moment he is facing the prospect of being digested, it feels too long. This is how our affliction feels. This is what it is to have sinned against a holy God and to experience the consequence for our sins. When we feel God's mercy doled out to us in the form of affliction, it feels too long. It feels too long. It feels like something that we're not going to be able to make it through. It feels like something that is going to overcome. It's going to swallow us up. I'm going to tell you another thing. This affliction, it is painful and inevitable. It is painful and inevitable. That's probably not in many of the sales manuals or the sales pitches you heard when you came to faith in Jesus. Hey, would you like to know Jesus? I mean, he loves you. He gave his life for you that you could come into him so that at some point that you could suffer like him and just know that it's going to feel too long and it's going to happen to all of us. Like that's not in very many of the gospel presentations that very many of us received. It was something of the love of God, your need for it, and your need to respond to it. But Christian, can I tell you that over the course of your life, because God loves you, and because he delights in bringing his best to you, and because he has a plan for you, and that plan that he has for you has the benefit of others in mind, then you are going to experience the inevitability of pain and affliction. And it's going to be so incredibly miserable and there's no amount of talking about it, there's no amount of working through it that is going to help you make it to the other side any faster than he intends for you to. Because God's affliction is perfectly tailored to the sin in your life. It's in his sweet mercy that he brings it near to you and allows you to experience the ravages of it, the anguish of it. Because when we consider the affliction of God, I want you to recognize this, and this is such a hard thing to hear in the middle of all affliction, it is radically beneficial. And it's so good for you. And it's so necessary for your development. And because the way that God works, he has some of you who are experiencing such incredible hardship right now and such incredible difficulty right now, not necessarily as a basis of some sin in your life, although possibly. And what God is building up and preparing in you, he is determined to utilize for the benefit of someone else in this body, someone else in this church. The Apostle Paul talked about God's ability to use the difficulties in our life for higher purposes, and he said it this way. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for, everybody say good. good. Do you believe it? Sure doesn't feel good. 
There's no amount in believing it will be good. There's no amount of believing that it will in fast that helps you to endure this any other way than to go through it. He makes all these things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. The author of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, he's talking about discipline. And he says, all discipline in the moment seems too harsh and too painful. He says, but God's discipline for us, he disciplines us as sons and daughters. Your heavenly father, he knows your proclivity, your bend towards specific sin. And your heavenly father, he knows the people you're going to come into contact with next week, next year, a decade from now. And so when he brings affliction and difficulty into your life, he does so because he loves you as a son or daughter. He does so because he's bending all things for good. And he does so because he has the future in mind. You see, God's perfect plan for your life and the perfect things that he's given you to do, no one else can accomplish for you. And so he uses the sweet mercy of affliction to bring about obedience. Now, you and I, when we see people going through these kinds of difficulties, when we see people experiencing affliction, some of us are just, man, we are good-hearted people. We are kind and we are gracious, and then there's the rest of us. And the kind and the gracious ones in this group, we see people going through these afflictions, and what do we want to do? We want to pull them out of it. We don't want them to experience the consequence of their actions and the consequence of their behaviors. So we inadvertently seek to work against God and to short-circuit the work that he longs to accomplish in them. It took three days and three nights to reach Jonah. It took three days and three nights to reach Jonah. Now, others of us, others of us, we don't have this particular uh, issue on, on being gracious and merciful. We see somebody going through something difficult. We're like, that's right. I'm going to join God in this. And like we see, we see ourselves as the rod of God's justice. And so we see them heavy burden. And we see them struggling through all of these various difficulties and all this affliction. And so we join with God in placing our foot upon their neck and pressing ever so delicately and precisely so that they know that we know that they need to do this. Too often the church, we are those who maim the wounded. We are those who see those suffering and we jettison them because it is too difficult to work in the messiness of their life, the messiness of their marriage, in the messiness of their parenting, in the messiness of their addictions, in the messiness of their sinfulness. We forget the words of Paul to the church in Galatia. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, look at what he writes. He says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, let you who are nosy get into their business. No, that's not, hold on a second. <laughs> let you who are nosy put a spiritual request out there, giving some of the details but not too many so that you can claim plausible deniability. No, that's not it either. He says, if anyone's caught in a transgression, you who are, everybody say Spiritual. Listen, this is what he's talking about. You who have woken up, you've had your quiet time, you memorize scripture, you share the gospel with half a dozen people, and you drink a full cup of leaded coffee. Amen? <laughs> this is what he's talking about. So if that's not you, don't do this. He's talking about those people whose heart beats for God. And because it beats for God, it longs to see people restored. He said, you who are spiritual should restore them, him or her, in a spirit of gentleness and he says, but keep a watch on yourself, lest you too should be tempted. So God calls us to be intimately involved in the afflictions and the difficulties of those around us. And in a spirit of gentleness, those of us who are hearing from the Lord seek to restore. We're not punishing. We're not chastising. We're not placing in time out. We want to see them restored. And as we come into this, God's using affliction 
and he's using it in our lives over the course of our lives. So if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you've experienced this. But likely, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you've not only experienced affliction from God, you've experienced this sense of oppression. And oppression comes from the enemy. So where affliction has the end in mind, and there's somewhere God is taking you and it is future-oriented, oppression is solely focused on the here and now. Oppression is the end. He longs to see you tied up. He longs to see you immobilized. And he longs to see you kick against the goads of God's affliction. He longs to see you in the middle of facing the affliction of God and just screaming out, I don't deserve this. I didn't do anything that bad. I didn't do anything to deserve this. You don't love me. You don't want anything to do with me. He longs to see the Christian withdraw themselves from the body instead of accepting the love and care of the local body. He longs to see them sever themselves from the care and the kindness of the people around them because he wants them to focus on what they've done wrong and the fact that it is true for them in that moment that they are so incredibly far and removed from the love of God is to be irredeemable. It's to be irredeemable. So he longs to keep you in this experience of oppression where you wake up every morning and it's what you think about. You go to bed every night and it's just right there. Everything about you and everything about your life is a series of unending triggers to drive you right back to this feeling of being removed and dislocated. That's what the enemy wants to do. It's mean and it's hateful. There's nothing redemptive. There's no amount of experiencing it that's producing something beautiful inside you. It's what God longs to do is to deliver you from this laboratory of difficulty, this experience of affliction. As Jonah is going through this and he's experiencing this, he said in verse 7, when my life was fainting away, I remember the Lord, my prayer came to you in your holy temple. And then he begins to give us practical insight. Verse 8, he said, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of a steadfast love. No, you and I aren't bowing down to physical idols created all around our house, but there are no shortage of idols in our lives. We worship at the idol of our health. We worship at the idol of our family. We worship at the idol of our children. We worship at the idol of our wealth, of our power, of our utility, of our, our, the delight that people have for us. We worship at the idol of delight and joy. And that can find its home, that can find its location, that can find its application in any any number of realms and in any number of ways. But when we begin to find our identity and when we begin to find our joy and when we begin to find our delight and when we begin to have a sense that I was made for this and that thing isn't the glory of God, we find ourselves made into worshipers of things instead of the worshiper of the one true creator God who made the sea and the dry land. Jonah said that when we do that, we forsake our hope of steadfast love. We abandon the pursuit, or rather we abandon the likelihood of receiving God's mercy because we're placing our hope and trust in the things we worship instead of placing our hope and trust in the one who rescues us from ourselves. Speaking of himself, he says, oh, but with the voice of thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. And then finally, the message makes it through to Jonah. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Do you remember who the first people in the book of Jonah to worship God, to make sacrifices before him and to vow vows? They're the the heathen sailors. They're these guys who did not know the name of the Lord. They didn't know God at all. They see the power of God on display. They fear God. And they're close to the end of chapter 1. It said they feared the Lord. They offered sacrifices to him and they made vows. They gave themselves to worship. So now here what we find is that God has been moving in the heart of Jonah to drive him to the place of obedience. And he follows in this same 
pattern because he has finally seen God for who he is. And he is ready to respond rightly to God. To God belong salvation. So Jonah's gone through this whole experience. For three days and three nights, the affliction felt too long. It certainly felt uncomfortable and painful. It took him a while to get to the fact that, that God had a vision and a plan for the, for the affliction. So how does God treat Jonah at the end of these things, this laboratory of growth, this place of getting him to this understanding, as R.T. Kendall said, that the belly of the fish is not a happy place to live, but it is a good place to learn? What he does with Jonah is he causes this fish to vomit him up. There's nothing dignified about that. I've never vomited somebody up, but I have a feeling they wouldn't enjoy it. I've never been vomited up, but I have a feeling I wouldn't enjoy that either. And so Jonah's there, and, and he, he's not sure what's going on. His heart is finally tuned to the Lord. The fish swims up to the land, and it just blah! Out pops Jonah. Oh, nasty. I'm never going to get this fish smell out of this. And that's what everybody told him, too. Jonah finally came out of the fish when he was ready to deal with his heart. I think the hard thing for me as I've spent time considering this this week is that you and I willingly give ourselves over to life in the belly of the fish. We do it as individuals, we do it as couples, we do it as a church. There's something about the discomfort of being in there that feels a whole lot more comfortable than being exposed. There's something in our sin, our way of being, our thought life, there's something in us in what we're doing that we choose to remain in this laboratory of affliction instead of moving forward and experiencing what God has called us to. So we choose to stay in affliction we choose to stay in this anguish. I think it could be that there's an element of shame. I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have been this way. If people really knew, they wouldn't love me. If people really knew. It could be that there's a bit of idolatry at work. <sighs> I can't come out of this. This is what I've built my life around. I, 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 I can't come out of this because you feel like there's some element of, of confession, of having to confess to the people around you. And so you choose to remain in the fish. It is not a happy place to live. It was designed and put in place an operative in your life that you would learn. Can I tell you this, that God's love for you is calling you from that place. He delights in you being so much more. Your neighbors, your coworkers, people in Kibera, people all over the world need to hear the message of God lived through your life on the far side of your affliction. Do you recognize what God did for Jonah? Before the word of the Lord went forth to Jonah to go to the Ninevites, the fish was already in place. All the various mechanisms for affliction were already in place and available to Jonah to make him the person God needed him to be to carry the message of God to the Ninevites. Jonah had to submit his heart to God before God would relent in his affliction. The belly of the fish, it's not a happy place to live, but it's a good place to learn. This morning, maybe you're here and you've never submitted your life to Jesus. Over the course of your life, you've lived as a moral person and a good person, but you've never come to the place where you've confessed Christ as Lord and you've turned from your sin and towards Jesus. 
God delights in you coming to know him. He sent his son Jesus that you might be saved through him. And it's by the power of his spirit that even now he calls to you. And listen, maybe you're a believer in this place and you're weighing through the possibility of what it would like, what it would be like to live a life free from this affliction. His affliction is perfectly timed. He's working all things together for good. And in his love, he's calling you forth. Let us be those who hear the word of the Lord and so respond. Amen. Let's pray together.